Welcome to episode 125. A special episode, you ask? It's just special that we made it. This is The Film File, the film show for film geeks by film geeks. Hello and welcome to The Film File. I'm Lee Ford. I'm Andy Meakin. And Andy Meakin, as you know, was the outbreak monkey last week. Andy, are you still the outbreak monkey? No, I mean, I'm tired a lot. And I've still got a bit of a cough and a bit of a croaky throat, as you might be able to discern from today's show. Uh, but generally, I'm feeling better, just in time to return to work tomorrow. Oh, I know, just the timing. The timing <laughs> just sucked on your behalf. Man, I, I feel for you. There's nothing worse than having your holiday taken up by by sick time. And I'm, I'm, I'm just about to join you. I have uh, an operation, which I thought was going to be about August, which I thought, oh, it's just when I go back to work. Oh, well, anyway. It's about two weeks' time. It's like, Oof. oh, right, right in the middle of my holidays. Great. So anyway, I'm, I, I feel for you. There's nothing worse than when you, you think you're there to relax for the long haul and then suddenly something kicks you out of your relaxation pattern. I think being able to relax and do nothing because I've not had any energy to do anything has meant that I've, I've had a pretty good week of catching up on things. Um, I've watched so much TV. I'm caught up on so many things. I finally, I, I, after you using it as a neat thing last week, it's been sat there in my watch list since it dropped. So I finally watched Pistol. Oh, it's and, good, isn't it? Oh, it's, I, I had so much fun with it. It's it's the cast are great. Yeah, the guy who plays John Lydon is, uh, is yeah, he's spot got on. that wild stare and the the eccentrisms and you know his jerky movements. And I, 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 yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. I know that you know John Lydon himself has uh, has sneered at it and said that he had no involvement and he thinks it's just a disgrace. But let's be honest. Every attempt that there's been to tell the story of the Sex Pistols has been embellished. I mean, I've, I've got a lot of love for the great rock and roll swindle, even though it's embellished and it's a mess. And um, there's the filth and the fury, which again it's is fantastic. embellished. Yeah, it's yeah, but uh, you know, we will never know the actual true story. Yeah, even of the Sex even Pistols. from the horse's mouth, so to speak, you are getting a point of view. Yeah, I just thought it captured the energy more than anything else. It captured the personalities, it captured the energy, and it captured that, like you said last week, the whole anyone can be, be be a rock star. Anyone, even without any talent, can just throw themselves into it. And as long as you've got some presence, you can do something. And that's what it showcased what punk was all about. It was like, yeah. you know, we, we can we can reclaim music for the people and we can do what we want. I loved the humor in it. I was, I was laughing so much at various elements. Like the, you know, when he when he's basically taught himself how to play the guitar within three days. Yeah. How long have you been awake? <laughs> Three days. He's like, and you're, you're playing guitar. And he starts to walk out and he just starts like riffing and just, t- just turns back around and walks back in. It's like, whoa. I, yeah, <laughs> I had a lot of fun with it. I thought the cast were great and yeah, really good recommendations. So, you know, I'm oh, going cool. to follow up on Lee's uh, neat thing recommendation last week and say that if you've not watched Pistol yet, get watching it because I well had a lot of fun it. with it. And it's the time and a place that I, I find absolutely interesting. You know, I, I don't think we'll ever get that, that kind of movement again within music. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get to the stage where there's a, a kickback at uh, the authority or the corporation of music because I don't think music has the power anymore yeah. that it did way back when. And it, funny enough, I was listening to, you know, those chart programs where they play the charts from years gone by. Uh, I was listening to the Radio 2 one that they always do every Saturday. And they yeah. were playing... 2004 i think it was and music still felt relevant and 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 strange how that 20 year period nearly 20 year period has has really chipped away of what popular music was that force that it had that you know that Ooh. you could change people's minds with a song or you could create new movements with a song and i think those days are, are sadly gone interestingly enough i think film has has changed that the, the way that technology has become easier, that people can make films that, and, and produce films and, and distribute films via YouTube in a way that they never could. And there's the freedom. There's the artistic freedom that, that music doesn't have anymore. Yeah. That felt like a soapbox moment. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> that felt change, like you a, have a soapbox, soapbox moment, moment, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's I ran for me. a change. <laughs> it's normally me who breaks out the box and stands there and starts <laughs> preaching to the world. Over this week as well with the playing catch-up, um, it's brought my year's viewing stats back up again. We're, we're halfway through the year. We are halfway. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Through Summer solstice was last week. So, you know, this is the time of year that I always take a look at my letterbox stats and see how I'm going. Yeah, I, I've done I've done okay. I've, I've watched 215 films this year. I feel that I've done okay. 
I've, That's not I've bad basically, going. I've basically watched an average of eight per week, which means that I've watched one and a bit per day, which um, is pretty solid going. But I wanted to just quickly shine a spotlight on my top 10 from this year so far. Already? Yes. And it's all films that have been released this year. There's none, none from last year, etc. This is just from 2022. And when you say that the one in 10th place is a four-star film, it shows the quality that we've actually had that a lot of people have kind of not seen. Okay. My top three, in no particular order, because it's very, very hard to discern between them, is The Batman, The Northman, and Everything Everywhere All at Once. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, I'll add two of those. I, I'm not going to give it away till the end of the year, but I think two of those will be in my, my top ten. Following up on four and a half stars, I've got a chunk of films, and there's three of them. Uh, kind of animated movies chip and dale rescue rangers i had a lot of fun with i thought it was hilariously inventive um, apollo 10 and a half which was a charming oh, yes. i'm in with you coming of one. age tale turning red which i think was pixar's strongest film in the past couple of years they make it into the list the outfit mark rylance on excellent form got four and a half stars out of me and the unbearable weight of massive talent for the sheer fun of it <laughs> managed to get four and a half stars and then just bubbling under in the last two places was another animated movie, The Bad Guys. Again, something that just completely caught me unaware. I, I can't wait to revisit it and revisit it. And also Adam Sandler's Hustle. Adam Sandler made my top 10. There's a crack in the world somewhere now. <laughs> There's cats and dogs living together. Apocalypse. <laughs> I'm going into a whole Bill Murray thing here. <laughs> can, you get, can you guess what my um, lowest rated film of the year so far is? I'm guessing... It's uh, Jurassic World Dominion. No, that's actually managed to get about 12 things beneath it. Oh, okay, then. I've seen some rubbish this year. I mean, yeah, you I, have. I, I mean, I watched Sky Originals. Of course, I've seen some rubbish. Uh, Mobius. Of course it is. Yeah. Mobius is the half star rating. It was even beaten by Marmaduke, and that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's been a... Yeah, it's quite easy to look back over the last six months and go, eh, there's not really been a lot out. But when I look back over my stats, I realise, actually, you know what? I've seen a significant amount and I've had a lot of enjoyment out of what I've seen. So you mentioned, or, or should I say I've mentioned, <laughs> a film that I may have given the game away with your, your approval of, uh, but you're going to be reviewing that later in the show. Yes, and that that'll is be. Jurassic World Dominion. Which I know you have another title for, but I think if you tell everyone now, it, I'll wait it really until the does, does become, why bother later on? <laughs> so what have we got in this week's show? Well, as ever, we'll be giving you all the reviews. Andy's probably seen more than he's, was expected under the present conditions of his COVID. But Andy, you're going to be talking about... Well, we promised it a couple of weeks ago, but COVID got in the way. But I played catch up and I've seen Lightyear and Jurassic World Dominion this week to finally give our thoughts on these films that have been out for a few weeks and have got mixed responses. So I'll find out what my response is later in the show. I've also seen a surprise drop on Disney Plus this week. The Princess gave it a shot. Find out what I thought of that later on. We'll be doing this week's deep dive into a Danny Boyle feature, and that is... 28 Days Later, an absolute game changer for the horror movie genre. But of course, before any of that, we're going to be giving you what we like to call, quite simply and quite honestly, the news. I tend to call it Colin. <laughs> Colin works. <laughs> so this is the Colin. Sorry, no, this is the news. Uh, and as ever, we're going to start with the box office. So, um... Lightyear, which I know you have now seen. I've decided I'm gonna I'm gonna wait on for a Disney Plus on this one. I think that when when certain films get out of your viewpoint, out of your horizon, mm. and they get pushed further and further back, I think this is one of those which is getting pushed further back that I'm starting to lose interest in it. So quickly, what did you think of Lightyear, and then tell us where it is in the box office? I enjoyed it, but it's problematic, and you'll find out the full review later on. As for the box office, so in the US. The Minions, Rise of Gru, has shot straight in over the weekend with 107 million takings at the US box office, uh, knocking everything down a slot. Top Gun Maverick is now in second place, taking another 25.8 million, showing that it's not really slowing down that significantly. Elvis 
has not quite left the building, but he's down to third place. 18.5 million in the US. Jurassic World Dominion on 16 million. And the Black Phone still showing that low budget horrors can draw in quite a good audience with 12.2 million in fifth place. Here in the UK, again, Minions Rise of Gru goes straight in at the number one spot. 10.4 million pounds taken in its opening weekend. Elvis is in second place, taking another 3 million this weekend, taking it to 10.2 million in the UK. Top Gun Maverick in third place, 2.7 million taken this weekend, 68 million it's taken total UK to date. Jurassic World Dominion, 1.8 million taken this weekend for a total of 30.4 million in the UK. And Lightyear hanging in in fifth place with another 863,000 added to its total of 8.5 million to date. You know, the big surprise of this weekend was Minions that was projected to do 70 million in the US and has well and truly smashed that. Now, it is the four day holiday weekend for 4th of July. So obviously there's a lot more family audiences going, but no one really expected the Minions film, which has been delayed and delayed and delayed to hit as high as it has. And it's also tracked really well internationally. So it's done more in its opening weekend than what Lightyear has managed to do over its opening three weeks. I think there's a lot of analysis at some point to be had on Lightyear. And to be honest, I was one of those people who thought that Minions as a craze had sort of been and gone. But but clearly, clearly everyone still loves it. I've, I've never got it. I'll be honest. I've, I've seen a couple of the Minions movies. I, I don't like the Gru character particularly so uh, it's always passed me by. I have very, yeah. very little in the way of interest. But, you know, clearly there's an audience across the world, a global crowd for this film. What else have we got? It's a very strange one. We've got a couple of release date shuffles. So Dune Part 2, which we only said last week was still set for that October slot next year. It's now moved to November 17th, 2023, which uh, puts it head to head with the Hunger Games prequel, Trolls 3 and the Ryan Reynolds and John Krasinski-led Imaginary Friends. Now, some people are saying, oh, are they panicking and they're moving it? You know what? November the 17th is a key release date in the cinema industry. That mid-November slot, all those films tend to be the heavy hitters that carry through up until Christmas and into the new year. So I think it's a wise move because that October can be a bit of a dead month. Yeah. It picks up on horrors, but a big blockbuster in October tends to struggle. November is when people are starting to get back into going to the cinema. The nights are drawing in. People want some entertainment in the evening. I think they've done a really wise move. I do think that one of those other three films at least is going to move, probably the Hunger Games prequel, because I don't think I don't think June 2 is going to target the same audience as Trolls 3, for example. No, and I was about to say, I mean, with its marketing, with the fact it'll be bringing a ready-made audience with it, uh, that audience isn't the same audience as Trolls. And I, to some extent, I don't think it's the same audience as, as the Hunger Games, which I still think is a risky move because it's been, time has moved on from the Hunger Games and it's one of those that, you know, the same audience who, who invested in the Hunger Games are now an awful lot older. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I, I think it's one of those, it, it looked great on paper. Does it look good when it, it comes to, to finding a finding an audience for it? It remains to be seen because we've seen how the Harry Potter franchise being drawn out with its Fantastic Beasts yeah, exactly. isn't generating the same kind of audience levels as what the Potter films themselves did because people were there for Potter. People were there for those that, that original story. They yeah. don't particularly care too much about the padded out backstory. And yeah, the Hunger Games were... Um, Jennifer Lawrence's films. Yes, yeah, the, the the character was is iconic with Jennifer Lawrence at that particular point in her career, um, and you could tell that she was getting bored by the time the fourth film came out, and that showed in her performance, I think. But a lot of those young adult novels that got 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 turned into movies, they, they didn't they didn't turn out quite as well no. as was expected at the box office. Now, I still think that the Hunger Games was a was a you had to be there to enjoy yeah. it. I don't think think the world's around for it. And by next year, even more so, that crowd's going to grow up because the you know the book stopped. So unless people are rediscovering the books for the very first time, then that might generate an audience. But I think if you ask the average 13, 14 year old about the Hunger Games, no idea. December 2023, just in time for Christmas 2023, there'll be the next Ghostbusters film. Yes, the sequel that was teased a couple of weeks ago which is going to return to New York City and is titled Firehouse, is being dubbed the next chapter in the Spengler family story and will once again be directed by Jason Reitman from a screenplay he's co-writing with Gil Keenan. I can't remember, Andy. Did you like it? I Did you dig thoroughly it? enjoyed it. Even, even though it was nostalgia heavy, I thought that the nostalgia was the heart of it. And I loved it. I absolutely fell for the whole 
lineup of characters, and I was so excited when they announced that they were going to do another film. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm there for it. It's not clear which members of the Afterlife cast are going to be returning. Since though they're saying it's going to be the next chapter of the Spengler family story, we can imagine the the Spenglers will be returning. I certainly hope Paul Rudd returns. You could just put Paul Rudd in anything, and it just yeah. it just ingratiates me to that film. Let's see what's going to happen. It's expected that Ernie Hudson will reprise his role because he popped up in the mid credit sting, which kind of teased Firehouse at the end. So whether the rest of the um, Ackroyd, etc. will be popping up, no one knows at this point in time. And Godzilla vs. Kong sequel has slotted itself into March the 15th, 2024. Adam Wingard is going to direct, and Dan Stevens, who's worked with Wingard in the past, is going to be cast in a lead role. Not as Godzilla or Kong. I mean, that, that'd be interesting, though. <laughs> I like Adam Wingard as, as a director. Godzilla vs. Kong was a, was a slugfest. It, it was light on intelligence, but delivered what audiences had gone to see a Kong vs. Godzilla movie was about. Two monsters yeah. beating the crap out of each other. It's as simple as that, and and I think that's what they've got to deliver. I I could take it or leave it. I've, I've got no investment in it. I will probably go if you and I go, uh, yeah. and and that's really where my loyalty lies and ends with it. I had a lot of fun with it in the same way they have a lot of fun with the Mortal Kombat franchise. I will happily watch anything about giant lizards beating giant monkeys. <laughs> that that's my ideal night out. Uh, we just spoke about the Hunger Games uh, prequel, which is titled The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. And Jason Schwartzman is the latest cast member to a be added to the A lot of time for Jason Schwartzman. Yeah, I, I just feel it's a shame that he's uh, tagging himself into Hunger Games. Um, he's going to play Lucretius Flickerman. Of course he is. The host of the 10th Hunger Games and ancestor to Caesar Flickerman, uh, who's played by Stanley Tucci. Uh, Schwartzman will join Tom you Blythe. See, then you've already, you've, that's it. I'm, I'm kind of out now where they've had to go, yeah, this is the ancestor of someone who's going to be doing exactly yep. the same job several generations down the line. And it just feels like laziness. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, the more I'm hearing about it, the less interest. And I had no interest. And now that interest is waning fast. Well, it's like the whole lot of the cast. I mean, Tom Blythe is playing Coriolanus Snow. Uh, who was played by Donald Sutherland. Hunter Schaefer is Tigris Snow. Josh Andres Rivera is uh, Sejanus Plinth. And Rachel Zegler as as a District 12 girl, Lucy Greybird. And it's set decades before the events of the previous films. Snow is an 18-year-old from a fading lineage assigned to mentor a District District 12 girl for the 10th annual Hunger Games. So it's basically the same story. Well, there's no no sense of threat because we know that if there's going to be a sequel, he's going to be in the sequel because we know he survives to be the bad dude in the Hunger Games proper. If you're going to do a prequel, do one which focuses on characters that we've not necessarily heard much about and we know will be dead before the main films. I'm looking at House of Dragon on um, HBO, which I'm looking forward to because... We're going to see some Targaryens in there that we've heard names mentioned and we've heard what they kind of did, but we know that they were dead by the end of this. We don't know how they died. And that's, that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? So there's some thrill, there's some peril. You're constantly going to be on edge as to what's going to happen and who's going to betray whoever. So that's how you do a prequel. Not just like, oh, well, this character, people liked it. So let's just show this character as a younger person. No, don't want it. Anyway, I got a bit of news. Well, um, you got me. I told you last week I reviewed uh, Elvis and had a lot of fun with it. Interesting with with Elvis that I walked out of the film and once I was out of the cinema, the the experience of the movie kind of caught up with me. I had a better time in retrospect than I did watching it. Did you know what I mean? Yeah. The more I thought about it, the more I enjoyed it, the more I was kind of blown away with elements of it. And not a perfect film, but what is? Anyway, Baz Luhrmann is doing pretty well at the box office, thanks to Elvis. Back in 2008, he didn't fare so well with his film Australia, which is the only Baz Luhrmann film that I've not seen. It was greeted with critical negatives um, and audiences didn't buy into it. So now he's going to do, I don't know if I can mention the hashtag Snyder Cut people because I know it upsets <laughs> upsets you greatly. But he's going to rework the film uh, into a limited series called Far Away Down. So effectively, therefore, it's a six-episode director's cut of the film Australia. And it sees Lerman rescuing cut footage, breaking up the story into chunks and changing the ending and updating the soundtrack. Did, did you ever see Australia? Was it worth the panning that it's got? I've not seen... I've got it on DVD. I've had it on DVD since it released on DVD. And it's right. still in its shrink wrapper. I've never opened it and I've never watched it. And I don't know why. Maybe now's not the time to watch it because you can... I'll just wait for the TV See soon. it in, in... I would imagine 
within the next year. Uh, it starred Hugh Jackman and it starred Nicole Kidman. So if you've not seen the film like Andy and I, maybe wait on and see it in its six hour glory. Yep. Sigourney Weaver's character in Avatar The Way of Water has been revealed. In fact, we've already seen her in the trailers that were released a couple of weeks ago because she's not reprising the role of Dr. Grace because she died in the previous film. Instead, she's playing the adoptive daughter of Jake and Natiri. We've got some thoughts on this, haven't we? Yes. I mean, James Cameron said, as an acting challenge, it's big. We're going to have a 60-something actor playing a character decades younger than her, her actual biological age. Sig, he calls Sigourney Weaver Sig. I love that. Sig (laughs) thought it was all kinds of fun. She just became younger. She looked younger. She had more energy. And she never stepped out of Kiri for our whole capture period. She had a glow on her face and lightness in her step and a fun spirit. Now... Why would you choose a 60-year-old actress to play a younger character? And this is where we tell you our thoughts on this. And my speculation, well, both of our speculation, is that the character is a new incarnation of Grace, who, if you remember from Avatar, those people who paid attention, there was some story in Avatar. Uh, when she died, she became one with the planet. She be, she melded with the planet. It, like All the connections came to her. Yeah. This is a reincarnation of Dr. Grace. I'm calling it now. This is a reincarnation of Dr. Grace in a younger body. I've got to agree, as you say, for the very simple reason of why bring Sigourney Weaver back if you're not going to uh, you're not going to uh, cash in on that that idea. Um, talking of Avatar 2, I wasn't aware that Kate Winslet had rejoined with James Cameron for this film. As we know, Winslet was famously in Titanic. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know. I, I mean, because when you look at the trailer, you can't say, oh, that's such and such. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, she's in it and she's going to be playing the fearless leader of the water people, Ron Al. And it's been revealed in an exclusive image in this month's Empire magazine. Ah, oh, the times when I used to run to the skip even to the news agents <laughs> to collect my latest issue of Empire. Ah, oh, halcyon days. And I've got like 500 under my bed just rotting away gently. If anybody wants some Empire magazines, contact the show. I genuinely thought you were saying I used to run to the skip to get a copy. (laughs) (laughs) After the news agents had thrown out the issues they couldn't sell, I used to run to the skip to get a copy. They were three months old. (laughs) All the news had happened, but I didn't care. Yeah, I I got rid of all of my old magazines last year. It's hard. Because I had had stockpiles of SFX magazine, Empire magazine, Total Film, Neon, Film Star, uh, loads of them. And they were just like just rotting away because yeah. no, you can't sell them. You try. I tried selling some of the SFXs because they had some of the early issues, include like with cover mounted like giveaways and things like that. Uh-huh. And I, I managed to sell a couple for like three pound each. It was like this isn't worth the postage. Yeah. So I just ended up skipping them. Sad just enough. got rid of everything. It's quite sad. I'm not doing that with me comics. I can't do. I can't bear the no, thought of doing it with me comics. It's but like um, losing a limb. But yeah, magazine collections that I realised that I'd never got round to rereading, and I never would. So mm. why why was I stockpiling? Yeah. There anyway. used to be a place in in town, but it's gone now. That was like an emporium for magazines, and you yeah. could just they you could take them in and they they'd resell them for you. But uh, that's gone. Unless anybody knows anywhere online, let us know. But yeah, it's a, it's it's a sad it's a sad indictment of this society we live in when when nobody wants your old magazines. Yep. Uh, speaking of things that nobody wants, uh, Madam Web film. Oh, well uh, done, sir. <laughs> that, that wins this week's award for the best uh, uh, segue. Unplanned. Uh, Sony Pictures and Marvel's Madam Web film, which is being led by Dakota Johnson, has now signed up Emma Roberts as the latest person to join the cast. Um, Sydney Sweeney, Celeste O'Connor, Isabel Merced uh, and Taha Rahim are also on board the project, which is kind of a part of the Sony Marvel universe, alongside those great hits like Venom, Morbius, and the one that we can't wait for, Craven the Hunter. Or should that be Craven the Lion Cuddler? The project serves as an origin story for Madam Web, a clairvoyant whose psychic abilities allow her to see within the spider world itself. S.J. Clarkson is directing, and Matt Sazama and Burke Sharpless pen the screen, screenplay. Again, this is another Sony film that they're tapping into a character and probably going to change and make it completely different to what the character actually is for no reason at all. I don't get it. I don't get it. No, no. I, I mean, we know that Sony are, are, are basically clutching at straws to try and develop a franchise. And Madame Webb's not a, that highly recognisable a character, even no. within comic crowds. So it, it, at least they, they might do something entirely different that really sets the stage to it being a, a quite a unique film. And it's, it's got a good growing cast, but I, it does seem at this stage quite pointless and, and as we said the other week there's more characters that you could explore 
Spider Woman, Miles Morales, etc., etc. The big problem is that Madam Web needs there to be a Spider Man character for her purpose of controlling the strands of web that connect all the Spider Verse together to make sense. And there's no Spider Man character in Sony's Spider Man universe at this point in time. <laughs> so it absolutely makes no sense at all. Speaking of superheroes or comic book characters, Christian Bale has revealed that he's not opposed to returning as Batman. Okay. I'm uh, guessing there's a caveat, though. There is. He's been talking to Screen Rant this past month, and he said, no one's ever mentioned it reprising Batman to me. No one's brought it up. Occasionally people say to me, oh, I hear you were approached and offered all this. And I'm like, that's news to me. No one's ever said that. I had a pact with Chris Nolan. We said, hey, look, let's make three films. If we're lucky enough to get to do that, and then let's walk away. Let's not linger too long. In my mind, it would be something if Chris Nolan ever said to himself, you know what? I've got another story to tell. And if he wished to tell that story with me, I'd be in. So the caveat is that, yes, they've walked away after three films, but if Nolan suddenly went, you know what? I really fancy going back to making comic book movies. Christian Bale would be right there at the drop of a hat. I, I say never say never, but I very much wouldn't put a bet on it. No, I can't see Nolan returning no. to it. I mean, he, Nolan kind of run out of steam on Dark Knight Rises because yeah. the sad passing of Heath Ledger on the second film lost his muse because he had did have plans to use the Joker in the final part and he had to redraft it. And you could see that he kind of didn't quite have the passion for it anymore and he just wanted to get it out of the way and move mm. away. So I don't think he'll go back. But on the subject of Warners, so we were saying last week that the Comic Con is going to finally yeah. see um, Marvel crop up after the, them not being there for the past five or six years. So there'll be well, some big announcements to come from those guys, no doubt. Well, Warners and DC are not going to have a huge presence there. Um, they will use some elements of it to showcase the HBO Max titles like House of the Dragon and Harley Quinn. And the Warners produce content like the Sandman series, which are expected to have whole H panels. However, Warners, including DC, will have no presence on the convention floor, a move that breaks with decades of precedent. So Warners could potentially have announced the, the DC lineup, but they're kind of doing that with the v DC fandom, aren't they now? Yeah, they've got their own fandoms each year. <laughs> Although whether they go ahead with one this year is another matter because the films that they have in the pipeline, aside from Black Adam, which we are seeing this year, and Shazam 2, which we're going to see, there's Aquaman, which is problematic because of Amber Heard. Yeah. There's The Flash, which is problematic because of Ezra Miller. There's Batgirl, DC's League of Super Pets. So it's kind of they've been put in a situation where if they came out to try to showcase anything, they wouldn't be able to showcase some of the stuff because they've still not made full decisions on what's happening with the materials. You took the words right out of my mouth. They're in that odd, odd place at the moment where they've, they've changed management at Warner's and, and therefore they're looking at changing direction. They've made some announcements already, Joker 2, yep. Batgirl's. Uh, testing very positively from what I hear. So there's there's still possibilities that Batgirl will make a cinematic release as opposed to just HBO. Apparently, the relationship that HBO Max have had with J.J. Abrahams has proved to be not particularly fruitful after all, and it was a big budget deal. His Constantine show still not happened. His Justice League Dark hasn't materialised yet. Yeah. Black Superman story still not there. So uh, that's not working out. So they're in they're in this odd odd position right at the moment, uh, Warners, and especially with DC. Are we waiting for another uh, Fantastic Beasts film? Now that's its other big franchise. Yeah, I, I can see why they've, they're not doing it at the moment. It's they're, they're in a in a weird transition period right now. They're kind of in a limbo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while they try to work out where they're going going forwards maybe there'll be a fandom later this year to showcase where they're going to be going from next year onwards but i'm not holding my breath on that one either two other studios who won't be um showcasing anything at comic con are universal pictures and paramount pictures that okay. are sitting out this year so that basically means that marvel and disney have, yeah that's it isn't it it's marvel got and free disney. Rain. <laughs> they're just taking over the entire uh con at this stage man i wish we could go somebody invite us We'll go. We'll we'll do a uh, pay for the we'll flights, pay for the panel. hotel, and uh, and uh, and we send don't us ask along. a lot, do we, Andy? We don't ask no. much. It won't cost that much. We'll even pay work. for his own food. Well, <laughs> okay, maybe not. I'll claim it on expense. <laughs> so, Andy, there are some science fiction films that double as horror films, uh, and I think you'd instantly go to probably Alien as your as your first one. But a perfect example of science fiction and horror and a film that I know you and I love. And again, there's been talk of a TV series version of this, and that is Event Horizon. Came out 25 years ago, 
I mean, the old blimey Charlie, I can't believe it's 25 <laughs> years ago. And it's still, for me, Paul Anderson's best film. Yep. So um, it's getting a limited edition 4K and Blu-ray steelbook event. So uh, the coveted release copy includes a number of features such as video, uh, theatrical trailer, five documentaries about the making of Event Horizon, commentaries from director Paul W.S. Anderson, uh, producer Jeremy Boll. In addition, there's a director's commentary alongside uh, the filming of the movie, as well as the deleted and the extended scenes and something called the unseen event horizon Ooh. now we know that speculation that there is a, a, a longer cut but that footage sadly has apparently been destroyed so there's that's why you've never seen the full director's cut of th this brilliant and at times terrifying cult classic but yeah. i am so in for getting that that blu-ray steelbook yeah I think I'll be investing some money in that. Um, I suggested a couple of weeks ago as one of our upcoming deep dives that we take a look at, look at Event Horizon. So uh, I can't believe we haven't done it. I, th I think, should we wait until this steel books out? That and sounds like a good idea. It. That sounds like we are planning yeah, rather than just throwing this show together. <laughs> it's a film that I've not revisited for about 10 years. But every really? time that I've watched it, I've thoroughly, thoroughly remembered why I loved it from that start. And it started my love of uh, Paul, uh, Paul Anderson. Paul W.S. Anderson, uh, to be clear, because there's too many Andersons in this world. And I know that I kind of joke about like, how, I, how I accept his nonsense that he puts out, but it just doesn't feel like any of his other films. No. It's got such a dark terror aspect. It's Hellraiser in space, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, That's what yeah. I loved about it. On the subject of sci-fi, the Russos, Anthony and Joe, um, who gave us uh, something called Avengers. Yeah, and they did, did quite well. You might... They did okay, I think. They're now prepping their alt history sci fi feature, The Electric State. Uh, speaking with Collider during an early press front run for the Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans led thriller, The Grey Man, Joe Russo has confirmed that they start shooting the project in October in Atlanta. It's based on Simon Stallenhag's illustrated novel and adapted by the Russo's usual collaborators, Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Following a runaway teenage girl, and her yellow toy robot on a journey through an alternate reality 1997 as a high-tech consumerist society is in decline. Russo adds that they're working with some old friends on the project, but won't say who. So expect some familiar faces from any of the Russo's projects to be popping up. And THR has reported that Millie Bobby Brown is set to star and Chris Pratt is in talks to star in the film. Okay, good cast. It's one that I'm keeping an eye on. I do like the Russo's. I do like what they bring to storytelling and filmmaking. And I do like sci-fi, so tick, tick, tick. I know what else you like. You like Stephen King. I do and like Stephen this King. week, the first official teaser art for Salem's Lot landed. Doesn't really give anything away. Delightfully spooky. Uh, shows you no character details. It's just uh, some figure shrouded in mist and uh, a sign for Salem's Lot. But whetted my appetite just enough before we just see enough. that up and coming teaser. Looking forward to seeing what they do with this. Because as much as I love the original Salem's Lot, and there's something that we've not deep dived as well. And I watched it recently. I, I got it for, as a Christmas present, so I've seen it quite recently. It is one of those stories that could get a fresh adaptation. And hopefully, hopefully it ticks all the right boxes for another fresh adaptation. So earlier this month, filming wrapped on the psychological thriller known as Apartment 7A for the Paramount Players label. Now, all that we knew about this project is it was being helmed by Relic director Natalie Erica James and starred rising actress Julia Garner alongside veterans like Diane West and Kevin McNally. But new sources have said that they have it on good authority that Apartment 7A is actually a top secret Rosemary's Baby film. Okay, didn't see that coming. If this is true, this makes it the third screen adaptation of the 1967 novel, uh, Polanski's 68 horror masterpiece and the poorly received miniseries from NBC from about eight years ago. Now, that miniseries was a straight remake. It's not clear if that's the case here or something more akin to a spin-off, such as the upcoming Prey to the Predator franchise. It could also be a spiritual sequel to the 1968 film. Now, interestingly, to back up all this theory and all this leak, IMDb's listing for it has actress Amy Leeson credited as Rosemary Woodhouse, which was Mia Farrow's character in the yeah. original, while McNally is credited as Roman Castavet the neighbour who turned out to be the coven leader. Paramount does own the rights to Rosemary's Baby, so this would make perfect sense. And Apartment 7A certainly has both Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes label and John Krasinski attached as producers. And Krasinski was attached 15 years ago to a previous potential Rosemary's Baby adaptation that never happened. 
So it all kind of adds up. I, I'm, I'm going to be highly, highly surprised <laughs> if it doesn't turn out the way we're thinking it is right now. It's looking very, very likely. Whether it'll be good, that's another story. Talking of another story, are you eagerly awaiting the next James Bond film? If I say yes and I'm holding my breath in anticipation, <laughs> I will asf- asphyxiate, I, I imagine. Well, as you know and I know, it's <laughs> two years time before the next uh, Bond film is likely to go into production. If not later. Barbara Boccoli has dismissed any rumours and talks of contenders for the role because she said that they've not even begun looking for the next actor because they're still trying to decide which direction to take the franchise in next. In her words, nobody's in the running. We're working out where to go with him. We're talking that through. There isn't a script and we can't come up with one until we decide how we're going to approach the next film because really it's a reinvention of Bond. We're reinventing who he is and that takes time. I'd say that filming is at least two years away. And this kind of makes sense because they can't just churn out a generic Bond film now because, uh, nope. well, spoiler alert, he died. So all those people are talking about Idris Elba, who's been approached to play Bond, which is clearly now not true as we're hearing it from the horse's mouth. He's, what, 50 now? So two years, 52. Uh, another year of production, 53. You know, he wanted to do three movies with him, possibly four. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be Idris Elba. Interesting that Idris Elba was in 28 Weeks Later, which we're talking about yeah, 28 was, yeah, Days was, Later, yeah. which I didn't realise until I was re-watching it this week. Anyway, yeah, so we've got to wait a bit longer for Bond to hit back on the big screen in whatever way, shape or form it ends up being. We don't have to wait much longer for Cameron Diaz to return to the screens. Yeah, she kind of semi-retired, didn't she? She moved away from, from acting. Why Do we know yep. why she moved away from acting, is there... Uh, she's never revealed exactly why, but if you look at the list of films that she had before she retired, it wasn't the strongest of output. Uh, right. She kind of she kind of started just getting like sidelined roles. Her last screen outing was her 2014's remake of Annie, which she got okay. she got a severe critical lashing for her portrayal um, of her character in it. And all of her films leading up to her retiring had all been savaged by the critics. So right. I think it was just basically. It looks like she just went, you know what, I'm stepping back. And she's done other things, other projects. You know, she's worked behind the scenes. She's launched different lines of things. So it's not that she's short of money, but she's clearly got some passion to come back and uh, get back in front of the cameras. She's going to be working with Jamie Foxx, who previously worked with her on Annie. And she revealed the news in a video posting announcing that it's a new Netflix action comedy, Back in Action, which begins production later this year that she's going to be in. Her story details are under wraps. In the clip, Fox enlists football champ Tom Brady to help Diaz come out of retirement. And Seth Gordon, who gave us Horrible Bosses, is directing from a script he wrote with Brendan O'Brien, who wrote Neighbours, uh, or Bad Neighbours, as it was known in the UK. Woody Allen, on the flip side, has said that he's no longer much interested in making movies. and is. I didn't think he'd made a movie for ages. He's still been churning them out, but it's his reasoning for wanting to stop making mov- movies and him losing the passion is the rise of streaming and the death of movie houses. Right. He's been speaking with Alec Baldwin during an appearance on Instagram live on Tuesday to promote his humorous story collection, Zero Gravity. And he says the enjoyment's gone after his next film, which is going to be his 50th as a director. He may be done. I'll probably make at least one more movie. A lot of the thrill is gone. When I used to do a film, it'd go to a movie house all across the country. Now you do a movie and you get a couple of weeks in a movie house, maybe six weeks, four weeks. Then it goes right to streaming or pay-per-view. It's not the same. It's not as enjoyable to me. While some people are saying this is another example of old man yelling at the clouds, I do kind of get it is that, you know, filmmakers like Scorsese and like Woody Allen, who've said that, you know, streaming, you know, fil- films should be on the big screen. They make films wanting them to be seen in a movie house. They want it to have that big screen, darkened theatre experience where people see things at the same time and they feel that it diminishes it. They're right. Sat at home, eating toast, watching on TV. Woody Allen finished his quote with saying, I don't get the same fun as putting a movie on and putting it in a theatre. It was a nice feeling to know that 500 people were seeing it at once. I don't know how I feel about making movies. I'm going to make another one and I'll see how I feel. And, And it's absolutely right. I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. There's nothing better than that shared experience of of feeling uh, of laughter or you, you saw the black phone when people all jump at the same time and yeah. that, that uh, somebody giggling at a comedy scene can be infectious to other people and make that film funny. I've sat in press screenings for comedies and no one's laughed. 
and and you walk away and you feel it feels diminished and then you see yeah. it with an audience and you see people engage in it and think it's the funniest thing since sliced bread and you know it changes your opinion of it same with horror movies you you need that shared experience and you just don't get it no matter how big your screen is in your house no matter how good your your sound system is what it lacks is an audience and and, and away from distraction where you can go and uh, you know pause a movie get a bite to eat or get a drink or come back or answer your phone or whatever um, that 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 sense of being part of something, part of what a filmmaker's vision is. And I, I totally agree. I don't want to be that old man shouting at the clouds, but, you know, some movies work. Yeah. The uh, the Irishman, for instance, didn't work for me on Netflix when I would have had a better experience with it on a big screen. It's the times that we live in and it's not going to change. It's just a shame that a lot of filmmakers are now starting to step away from their passion because they don't feel that people will appreciate their product anymore in the way that they want them to be appreciated. Yeah. And this all ties back to what other directors and filmmakers have said about streaming is a non-entity that things land on streaming and then just quickly vanish there's no buzz there's no hype there's no promotion mm -hmm. there's times that you suddenly find that a film has been out for four weeks on streaming that you didn't even realize had dropped yeah yeah and that's a sad sad thing because streaming should give an opportunity to really showcase a variety of films and getting promotion behind things but it's now just used as content drops. Even big hit TV shows and films. Stranger Things Season 4 Part 2 landed only two days ago. And already the buzz has died down because everyone's watched it. Yeah. And there's no hype. And this is Netflix's biggest TV show. Yeah. So, yeah, you, this this is why you just got to kind of understand that when filmmakers such as Woody Allen, regardless of what you think about his personal life, regardless of what you believe about him. He's a quality filmmaker who's sadly going to be stepping away for what I think is the wrong reasons. Yeah, and leaves behind a huge body of work. Now, you might not like everything that Woody Allen's done, but there will always be something you will like. Even if you go back to, to his early days when he was much more uh, a broader comedian, you know, there is so <laughs> much to enjoy with Woody Love Allen. Love and Death is still oh, one of my man, favorite films of all time. That, <laughs> Bananas, uh, Sleeper, uh, Take the Money and Run. I, I, the list goes on. And I think on that soapbox moment, that rounds up the news. You're listening to The Film File, the film podcast for film geeks by film geeks. And hey, guys, if you're not already a subscriber, then please, please join us. All you have to do, head over to your favorite podcast platform, check out The Film File, hit that subscription button and be the first kid on the block to receive your brand spanking new episode of The Film File and become part of the Film File family. And how do you do that, you ask? Well, you don't have to fly into cosmic rays to become part of this particular family. Though, if you want to, it's up to you. I, I don't advise it. <laughs> or otherwise, you can just simply... Uh, you can head over to Twitter. You can follow us at Film File UK and become part of our extended family. You can follow us on other social media platforms. Just search for Film File UK. We'll be out there. Or you can get directly in touch with us. Like that old uncle who's not got in touch for years. Get in touch with us via email and spell it really wrong and send it to the wrong person. Podcast at filmfile.uk. We'd love to hear from you. Talk about anything entertainment focused, actors, films, TV shows, whatever you want to. We'll reply to each of you individually, if you do, or we might give you a shout out on the show. And if you've got friends who aren't part of the family, then do us a big, massive try and talk someone else into joining the film file, because the more that we can get on board, the more we can do with the show. And you know what, Andy? I have been designing some film file t-shirts. So we're going to start looking at maybe marketing some merch. So if you're interested in a film file t-shirt, get in touch with us on all the social media and we'll tell you uh, what's going to be happening. And as soon as we've got a design ready for it, let you know. It'll make the perfect Christmas gift. It's now time for this week's Deep Dive. I can't believe this came out 20 years ago. And having watched it recently, it still feels incredibly fresh. A post-apocalyptic horror film directed by Danny Boyle, written by Alex Garland. This is this week's Deep Dive, 28 Days Later. The chips are infected. Infection. Infected with what? Exposure. You have no idea! The days <laughs> are numbered. We have to leave now. No one ever comes back. They're dead, and you're going to be next. Open up! Killian Murphy. Oh, in the apocalyptic thriller, 
28 days later. This low budget but impactful film stars Killian Murphy as a bicycle courier who awakens after a coma to discover the accidental release of a highly contagious virus which has caused a breakdown of society. The film also stars Naomi Harris, Christopher Eccleston, uh, Megal Burns and Brendan Gleeson and it did something new. Now there's always that controversy with 28 Days Later, are they zombies, are they infected? They're infected but it did something as creative and clever as George A. Romero did with Night of the Living Dead that reinvigorated a particular horror trope. This film was shot digitally. It was shot by Danny Boyle in a way that he utilised at that point handheld digital cameras, which gives the film this sense of uh, almost documentary feel to it, a sense of urgency, uh, a sense of style. And even though it's 20 years later, the impact of this film has not gone away. I think we've both got a lot of love for this film. Um, and one day we'll talk about a film that we've not got a lot of love on. Oh, we did, Buckaroo Banzai for you. Never forget you. <laughs> but this film absolutely hits its target. It does that rare thing, which is makes England a great place to do a horror film. Uh, we're sometimes neglected when it comes to sort of big scale horror films. This made it feel big, made it feel realistic, and also made it feel very, very grounded. Andy. 28 days later. I remember when this first came out and it absolutely blew me away watching this on the big screen because Garland said that he was inspired by his love for Romero's films, uh, but also by things such as Day of the Triffids. Yeah, absolutely. That's the kind of thing that he wanted to bring into this new take on zombies, which they deliberately didn't want to call them zombies because they were rage infected. And up until this point, zombies had always been slow moving and shambling. Now, in this modern era, we've seen so many zombie films that have had speedy zombies. Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead remake had speedy zombies. they become like a trope, they become a thing now. But this was the first time that we saw fast-moving zombies, and it was such a game-changer for the whole genre. It's like no longer was it like people could just walk past with a cricket bat and knock people, knock it, the undead to the ground while they're getting away. Now you're having to run, you're having to sprint, and they're intelligent as well because the rage infected are not brainless. They retain their intelligence. So they know how to open doors. They know how to climb up ladders. They know how to do things. It's just that they're angry all the time. It, what's interesting with watching this is that I, I watched it this week twice. I watched it through once and then I realized I actually had the Blu ray. So I watched it again with the um, commentary and getting the commentary on it opened up my eyes to a few little tricks that they used in there, such as the sound design of the zombies, which sounds like gurgles and grunts and snarls. It's actually layered in occasional like I hate yous and you're going to die and I I'm so angry at you in an almost incoherent way. But it's to express the fact that everything that the zombies is doing is not brainless gibbering. It's anger. It's rage. They are led and brutal because they are infected with this infection that just makes them permanently angry. They are not zombies. They are intelligent, angry people. And it's, it's, it's a film about the breakdown of society, but also the breakdown of mentality when you're in that red mist, angry state and how you can't think straight and you just come across as a raging monster. You said about the, the look of the film, you know, that the handheld digital cameras give it that grainy aesthetic. It gives it a bleached, very real aesthetic, making it almost like a documentary, like you say. And it really brings you into the story. And the story, Killian Murphy waking up from the coma and then wandering through the deserted streets of London. Now, again, look at the past few years, and we've all seen videos on YouTube of people walking through the deserted streets of London back in 2020 and early 2021, when the lockdowns were taking place. But when you look at this film, and you have to realise that London, it's very rare to actually get five minutes with an empty street. And they used not only early morning shooting before all the traffic was there, but apparently they would hold up the traffic for 30 to 45 seconds at a time to get a shot and then let the traffic go past and then hold it up again two hours later and then let everything go past, and only do like short little cuts, but it makes the whole of London look so desolate and eerie, and if you've ever been to London, you will understand the impact that that empty shots of the streets, as he's wandering through them, yelling out for anyone to hear him, is so chilling and so unnatural that it just works so perfectly. It's, it's the fact that they were shooting on these basically 
handheld Canon digital uh, video cameras um, and DV cameras were, were so lightweight back then. Uh, they were still shooting on, on digital tape a lot of the time, but you could do multiple takes. You could have several cameras rolling at once. Uh, and when you're only shooting for 40 seconds, you've suddenly got 80 seconds of footage. You've suddenly got three or four minutes worth of footage by having different angles. And that's the reason it's got this whiplash cutting style as well, because they were working with, at that time, pretty much new technology. Now, I think it's one of the first films that that was shot digitally in that mm. particular way. And it all adds to the the terror, this intimacy, this idea idea that it feels real and 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 dv take did that you know you don't get the gloss that you get off film you get this 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 sharpness this this reality to it you know you look at look at youtube now it's not a million miles away this film came out after uh 9 11 but they were shooting just before uh 9 11 and there was a moment where you see the missing persons on the board that, that killian murphy's character checks out which is sort of haunting of, of what happened after after the twin towers went down uh, and this is a film very much of its time in the way that uh, night of the living dead was at its time but it kind of feels timeless with you mentioning the empty streets around covid because you know the idea of a a, um, a nationwide international virus that is, is is bringing society to a standstill makes 28 days later feel very very relevant and and it's even watching it now it's not aged it really does feel contemporary. Yeah, it still works and it still hits quite hard. The character of Killian Murphy's playing Jim is basically waking from the coma and he's like a lost child in this desolate wilderness who's lost his own family. And each of the groups that he tags on with has a kind of father figure to try to guide him through this new world. And it's as he encounters how different groups are starting to try to adjust to this new environment that they live in. It changes him as a person throughout. You've got Brendan Gleeson, who the introduction to Brendan Gleeson's character, he comes across like body armored suit, beating the rage infected back, brutal, thuggish. Then as soon as he takes off the helmet, he's calm, he's gentle, he's he's a lovable father figure. But then he starts to change. He starts to get affected by the environment. And then when he gets to the final act and you've got Eccleston's Major West, who comes across as like quite a serious, sensible leader. After all, he's military. And, you know, if anyone's going to protect them, it'll be him. But then he appears to be rapidly losing control. And that's the final straw for Murphy's character, who goes from being this lost and empty inside person, shouting out for anyone to hear him, to the chilling moments as his own humanity is being eroded, as he's stalking people through the, the country house that um, they're all holed up in and getting his revenge on the people who he feels have betrayed him. It's such a chilling transformation throughout. And Murphy is absolutely, absolutely mesmer mesmerizing from the start. It's political allegory, it's horror, it's action, and it's all combined perfectly for a fresh, for its time, take on a very tired genre at that point in time. Yeah. I mean, the film found its audience for a film that only cost amazingly £5 million. In the UK, it took 6.1 million and became a surprise. Internationally, it took over $45 million uh, despite a, a limited release. Um, the film garnered over $85 million by the end of its release. So it did superbly well. It took Danny Boyle onto the international stage. I mean, in this country, highly renowned director, it just raised his game considerably. And you know what? Danny Boyle is a national treasure. Absolutely. Uh, and then we got surprisingly we got a sequel and uh, there was always talk that there was going to be a sequel uh, and then we got 28 weeks later which was released in 2007 uh, Danny Boyle and Alex Garland took over uh, producing roles alongside Andrew McDonald the film was directed by Spanish director Juan Carlos Fresnadillo and as far as sequels go it's not as perfect as 28 Days Later, but it's certainly an interesting uh, an interesting take on the stories. It, it starred uh, Robert Carlyle, Rose Byrne, Jeremy Renner, Imogen Poots, Harold Perrineau, and Idris Elba, interestingly enough. Have you got any love for this? I, I know I have. I think I've got a lot of problems with it. I think it's a little bit over all over the place plot-wise, but there's a lot I, I like about it as well. This is a film that I watched when it came out at the cinema, and I only finally rewatched it this past week. You see, I've not, I've only seen a bit of it 
one other time and what like 28 days later i was drawn back to almost immediately i bought bought the uh, dvd as soon as it came out this this i've only seen i think once in the last 10 or so years i feel that i feel that it held up pretty well um, robert carlyle the film starts off with robert carlyle and his wife and a few other survivors holed up in a country cottage which comes under attack by the rage infected and carlyle's character has to make the devastating choice between fleeing and saving himself or trying to save his wife and he makes that heartbreaking heartbreaking choice to run before the film then cuts across the passage of time to show how the UK fell through the virus until it got to a point that everyone who was left on the country was rage infected and then they started to die out through starvation. And then 28 weeks later, the US military have installed outposts within major cities in the UK and are starting to repopulate the land with survivors who had escaped overseas. The virus was contained on UK soil and hadn't spread around the rest of the world. Robert Carlyle's character was reunited with his children, but it turns out that the virus hadn't completely gone and neither had his wife. She somehow had an immunity to the virus that kept her just on the edge. Now, this sequel manages to stand well as a film and it has a reason to exist. There's a slightly different approach. The exploration of how much of the person remains inside the infe- uh, infected is presented more here and it offers a sharp take on the genre once more. The militaristic manner to eradicate all life makes the human threat as high as the infected threat. And Jeremy Renner has a key role in a very early outing for the actor. And whilst a lot of familiar tropes of the genre are wheeled out, the manner in which it plays ensures that the tension keeps mounting. It still has that grainy feel. It still has that low budget approach, albeit with a US centric kind of backing to it yeah. um, there's some great moments in this and i get what you're saying about like that it just feels that there's a lot of ideas that don't quite work because it is very scattershot whereas the first film is like it's basically three acts this group of survivors this group of survivors this final group of survivors and the breakdown of one character this is different in that the lead character robert carlisle actually becomes an infected halfway through but then it becomes an exploration kind of of how he's retained some of his memories and so he's still focused and targeted on his own children towards the end. But it's moments in the film that make it stand out. There's a nail-biting, darkened subway scene towards the end where they're using an infrared scope to guide each other down into the darkened subways of London. And it's genuinely edge-of-the-seat gripping tension as you're watching in every bit of shadow for any movement. The final shots of the film suggest a further expansion of the story that we're still yet to see. And Boyle and Garland, as recently as 2019, have spoken about they've got ideas for a third film, which they've tentatively titled 28 Months Later. But by the time they get around to making it, they might as well call it 28 Years Later. (laughs) Yeah, it will be about that, won't it? Um, (laughs) Yeah, I I don't dislike the sequel. Um, There there are lots of elements. It's got some great action sequences. The way that the the infection runs through uh, an escaping crowd, for instance. The way that uh, it it broadens out the story. Um, I think it loses a little bit of direction. There are so many sadly thought out coincidences that, I think you can get away with one. By the time you get into the third and fourth coincidence, it it, it feel it felt wrong and it and it threw me out of the story. And it just lacks that little bit of humanity that I think Twenty Eight Days Later has, and that's, and that's why it's such a successful film. And I think that's why it stood the test of time because it's it's a very much a human film, despite the monster, uh, despite the, the the breakdown in civilization. Um, this idea that that. That good people bonding together is what humanity is about and, and that you can overcome at times some of the worst evils possible. And I think that's lacking in the sequel. But I would certainly be up for revisiting this world, especially if Danny Boyle was to was to come back to it. Because I think while 28 Days Later has said a lot about the early 2000s, I think a, a new film could say an awful lot of this world that we live in post-pandemic. And I think it would be an interesting place to start. If you haven't seen... 28 days later i implore that you do and if you want to see it andy where can we find it both of them are available on disney plus on their stars section give them both a shot you can also rent them or purchase them from wherever you normally rent or purchase i do wholeheartedly after finally realizing that i had the blu-ray recommend picking up the blu-ray double box set because the extra features the cut scenes the commentaries all lend something and offer some great insight into not only the filmmaking, but the ideas behind both films. So well worth picking up on physical media. We'll be back again in next week's Film File with another deep dive. And now it's time for our reviews. 
Andy, what have you got? So let's start with giant dinosaurs stomping on the face of the earth in Jurassic World Dominion. I mean, Dominion. And I think you need to say very little more <laughs> about it, Andy, because I think you've given the game away. You know, the, the longer this has been going on, the longer it's been out, the more reviews that I've read, the more people I know that have seen it, the less interested I am in, in visiting this film. Even if it turns up on streamer, I probably watch it because the kid will like it and I'll probably watch it with him. But I have, I was kind of done by the last movie. Is there any reason for me to see this particular Jurassic World. Jeff Goldblum and that's it. Okay, then I'm out. The doomsday clock might be out of time. Come back. I always come back. We're on the verge of extinction. Let's all try to stay positive. Nobody said saving the planet would be easy. Is that a dinosaur on your shoulder? Yeah. The franchise that never seems to end churns out a bloated sixth film packed with everything we've seen before in a contrived and generic plot that has maybe come to the franchise four or five films too late. We finally have the world with dinosaurs and humans trying to coexist, but still the film decides pretty swiftly to move all the story to one reserve so we're effectively just in Jurassic Park again. A lot of promotion has been around the return of the original trio of Goldblum, Neil and Dern. And unlike the previous film, they do have larger roles to play in this film. But their reasons for inclusion feel so contrived, resulting in it feeling more like an executive's insistence to wring the last bit of life out of a struggling franchise. Still, given that Ellie, Alan and Ian are three names that we still remember, whereas the cast of the recent films of Pratt, Dallas Howard and Sermon are completely unmemorable, Maybe it was a smart decision. The film is packed with problems, the bum-numbing runtime being just one of them. Pratt's character, who I've just looked up and discovered is called Owen, now seems to have Force-like abilities for some reason, simply being able to hold his hand up to any dinosaur and make them stop. Whilst this was a tactic he used previously, that was on the trained raptors such as Blue that he'd worked with since they hatched, and it makes no sense at all for it to work on wild roaming predators. In addition, every time the gang are looking for shelter or trying to get into somewhere, they will be just about to do so when a roar or a noise will come from nearby. And rather than simply hurrying up and escaping, they stand motionless, looking around until a great big dinosaur comes into view and approaches them. Only then do they attempt to flee, making for a forced, staged peril that I found very hard to care for one bit. Then, throw in the usual tropes of the franchise, such as how the T-Rex is somehow a hero, yawn, and moments where characters say something, but then do the exact opposite, and it does naught but shine a spotlight on everything wrong with this franchise. The end result is a film packed with action that feels so tired, and which makes dinosaurs seem boring. A subplot about genetically manipulated locusts meanders in and out of the main plotline, padding the runtime out far too much for no real impact, and by the end of it all, you just hope that this is the last that we're going to see of this franchise. Moving on, what's next? So another film that's been out for a few weeks, and that's Lightyear. Yes, Pixar's latest animated entry, which has confused a lot of people as to what it's all about, which I don't think the marketing has helped this film. We're marooned on this planet because of me. I need to make it right. Could help you. The probability of survival is 38%. Seems a bit low. One day you're going to come up against something you don't think you can do. And then you're going to do it. Let's get everyone home. And from then on, you're you. Disney Pixar's Lightyear. Rated PG only in theaters. Confusion over what this film is hasn't helped the box office. And the film has underperformed as a result. Which is a shame, because Lightyear is a fun sci-fi romp albeit one that doesn't feel very Pixar on the whole. This is supposed to be the film that Andy saw in 1995 that launched the toy range of Buzz Lightyear, even though claiming to do so creates a bit of a problem in that none of the other characters appeared to get toys of them, and surely Socks, the robot cat companion, would have been a bigger toy. But that aside, we're introduced to Buzz Lightyear, who after his insistence on being the hero, leads to the crew of the exploration vessel he was part of being marooned on a remote and somewhat hostile planet. He sets about trying to fix things on his own by finding a way to power the craft's hyperspace drive. His tests push him forward in time in increments, 
Whilst around him, the survivors form a colony and settle, until one time jump sees him return to a colony under attack from a robot army led by a being known as Zerg. Animation is as polished as you would expect, and the basic story of Buzz needing to learn to trust and rely on others does have that core Toy Story aesthetic to it, but there's something missing to make it feel really emotionally Pixar. Yes, the inclusion of comic relief in the guises of Taika Waititi's recruit and Peter Soane's robotic companion cat Socks provides some laughs and charm, but it all feels very generic overall. Although, maybe that's the point. After all, this is the film that Andy saw in 1995, and generally, it feels very much like it belongs in that era. I think I am going to wait for this for Disney+. Plus. And, and that's saying a lot from me, because I, I love Pixar, and, and, and I've been unhappy that Pixar have been short shrift recently and just going straight to yeah. Disney Plus but on this particular occasion um, I, I'm going to wait it out. I think it's a shame because Soul and Turning Red were both dr- dumped onto Disney Plus and didn't get the attention that they deserved whereas this yeah. has gone to the big screen and should have been put onto Disney Plus because it feels like it feels like a, an unnecessary spin-off and maybe this should have been the small screen adventure. The other two should have been the big screen ones. And then finally... Now, this was a surprise. This popped up on my feed on Disney+, Plus, and I thought, eh, it's called The Princess. Eh, what's it going to be like? I read the synopsis, like, okay, sounds interesting. And watched it, and had a lot of fun with it. Kill the princess. Shall we? Well, I usually work. You've made. It looks like you got me to the altar after all. The princess. Oh, I needed that. You know those video games where you're a lone warrior saving the princess and the kingdom from an evil overlord, and you fight your way up the tower, battling wave upon wave of enemy until you encounter the big boss after a few occasional sub boss fights? Well, imagine taking that concept. But instead, it's the trapped princess in the top of the tower who's fighting her way down the castle to save her family and kingdom. That's the concept behind the princess which landed on Disney Plus this week. Dominic Cooper plays Julius, the cruel despot who plans to rule the kingdom after forcing a marriage to the princess, played by Joey King. Always referred to just as the princess, she's never given a name because, hey, video game kind of characters. However, she's got other plans as well as years of combat training. And she sets about on a desperate mission to fight for her freedom and release her captive family in a very slight story that serves as nothing more than excuse for a variety of fights. It's got the feeling of die hard in a castle and King throws herself into it all. Secret passages behind walls, escapes into the underbelly of the castle and some impressively choreographed action moments resulting in just over an hour and a half of brutal and sometimes bloody joy. This is a lot of fun albeit quite disposable. It's a film that knows what it is and it has so much fun with it. And if it's having fun, why shouldn't I? Will there be audience members screaming woke at the screen? Of course there will be. That's the world uh, we live in. That's the world that we live in. But you know what? If they feel that this is woke, then I'm glad that woke exists because this... This was Die Hard in a Castle. So what can we expect this week? I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be much of an impact week this week. Uh, no, there's, there's not much coming out this week. Uh, there's a, For those who might have listened to our deep dive uh, a couple of months ago, there's the classic Doctor Who double bill. Is getting wait, a limited I mean, I release. Can't. I saw the great poster and I thought, I'm, in. <laughs> I'm so in. Uh, you'll know how much we loved those films. And they've had a full restoration, which is getting limited cinema release. And that's about it. There's there's some film called Thor Love and Thunder coming not out as well. It. It's not going to do well. But never heard of it. It's some guy Comic called Tyson Waititi working on it. Who knows? But yeah, I mean, obviously that's going to be all over the box office this week. Um, on Now TV in Sky, there's How to Please a Woman. Sally Phillips is a woman who, after mistakenly booking a male prostitute instead of a stripper, comes up with a unique business idea, using male prostitutes to clean houses for lonely housewives in a plot that seems straight out of a gender-swapped carry-on universe. I was going to say, I'm sure that's a carry-on <laughs> movie. And the South of Heaven, Jason Sudeikis and Evangeline Lilly, starring in a crime drama about an ex-con who tries to go straight, only for the parole officer to have all the plans for him. On Netflix... Dangerous Liaisons, a brand new high school set adaptation of the classic tale. And The Sea Beast, an animated offering from director Chris Williams, who gave us Moana and Big Hero 6, two good names there, uh, set in an era when beasts roam the seas. A young stowaway named Macy causes problems for the fierce hunter Jacob Holland. I'm in for that. 
Amazon, Birds of Prey, the DC Universe Harley Quinn film. It's a lot of enjoyable it fun. Okay. I have a lot of fun with it. And on Apple TV, Blackbird, the true story of convicted drug dealer Jimmy Keane, who's offered his freedom in exchange for coaxing a confession out of suspected serial killer Larry Hall and finding out where his victims are buried. This is a limited series, and it's Ray Liotta's final starring role, which also sees Taron Egerton star as a younger version of Ray Liotta's character. We'll be uh, talking about Thor, Love and Thunder in next week's show, where hopefully both of us have had a chance to see it. I pretty much doubt neither of us will get a chance to have watched it. So that's about it for this week. But before we go, we do our neat things. That's stuff that Andy and I have watched, enjoyed, uh, listened to, A, you name it, as long as we've had a good time with it. It's our neat thing. So, Andy, your neat thing for this week is? It's got to be the fact that I've spent so many hours this week on one particular video game, and I've still not completed it, but I am going for 100% completion. And that is Miles Morales' Spider-Man game. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to playing this. I've not bought this at all, and I don't know why I've not picked it up, because it's exactly the same kind of game. It's exactly the game that I love. I loved the original Spider-Man game on the PlayStation 4, I just never got around to buying this one. But I've managed to download it as part of my PlayStation Plus Premium subscription. And I'm absolutely adoring it. It's more of the same. It's swinging through the city in a complete freeform nature, doing missions, a great story setup as you are miles, still learning his abilities and still slowly developing them and getting embroiled in a plot where an organisation has picked up from where the kingpin had let, left off and is starting to terrorise the city. But what makes these games fun, and it's the same with the other Spider-Man game, is the exploration and all the little hidden objectives and all the trying to find every secret package and secret location through there and the simple interaction with NPCs. Every now and then when you drop down to street level, a little triangle blip will appear over a nearby passerby and you go over, click triangle, and you high-five them and they thank you for for helping rescue them. And it's little things like that that it's just like, you know what? This feels immersive. This is charming. This is fun. And the gameplay mechanics of this, they could churn out 400 of these games, and I will never tire of this style of gameplay. There's something to be said about a game that lets you web swing through the city, even when you're aware that there's no way that your web thread actually hit anything above you because there's nothing above you. You are proper Spider-Man. You're swinging from clouds, apparently. But it's just great, energetic fun. Like I say, I've not completed it yet. If I had just played the storyline, I'd have completed it by now. But I am exploring everything. I'm finding all the secrets. I'm finding every little hidden location and hidden reference that there is to New York or comic book law or whatever. This is immersive fun. Miles Morales Spider-Man on the PS5. And the PS5 with its enhanced responsive controller, the different beats and feedback that you get through the controller definitely give it some extra edge over a standard dual shock controller on the PlayStation 4. Thoroughly, thoroughly recommended. I'm so in because I had such a good time with with Spider-Man. I played it a couple of times on the PS4. Absolutely loved it. Everything that you've said about that game sounds as though it's, it's made it over into Miles Morales. And of course, it was going to be a step up and, a, and, and development. But I, I just had so much fun playing Spider-Man. It's so immersive. It does make you feel like you're in New York. And, and especially, because I, I know New York, fairly well i've spent a lot of time there and there were bits last time i was there going i've swung from that building i <laughs> climbed up there i've i've swung down this street i web crawled over uh, this part <laughs> it was it was amazing to go i have i feel as though i'm not in new york i'm in a spider-man game so i i can't wait to play it um it's it's high on my wish list uh a, a ps5 and that would be the top of my wish list. Okay, my neat thing, and I think I mentioned this uh, last week, is Umbrella Academy Season 3. Landed on Netflix as a huge dump of every episode, so none of that waiting around. You can just ingest this in in a day, if you so wish. I haven't. I'm watching it night by night and, and having a good time with it. So if you're not familiar with Umbrella Academy and you're a geek, so you pretty much should be, it's based on a a comic book series that was out on Dark Horse Comics, written by Gerald Way, he of My Chemical Romance, illustrated by Gabriel Bra. The series revolves around a dysfunctional family of adopted sibling superhumans. Uh, The series kicked off was when they reunite for the mystery of their dead father and uh, they became this incredible dysfunctional family uh, that just were 
in the right place or the wrong place, depending how you look at it, for an imminent apocalypse. Season one was great and especially great for some of its needle drops. It has a, has a fantastic soundtrack. Uh, series two for me is where it kicked off and we got to know the characters. And and so far with season three, I'm not disappointed. This is this is uh, punk rock superheroes at its best. These are our superheroes who are not the best at, at their game as they are now in this particular series thrown into an alternate world in which they are no longer the Umbrella Academy. It's just silly fun with, as I said, a kicking soundtrack. Great cast, uh, standouts being uh, Robert Sheehan, who you might remember from Misfits, Tom Hooper, Aidan Gallagher, who was brilliant as five. And they address the gender change from Ellen Page to Elliot Page within it. It's just good, anarchic, it's the anarchic version of the X-Men. Let's be honest. This is what this is about. But it is a lot of fun. It's got a great visual style to it. That's Umbrella Academy Season 3 now on Netflix. And that, folks, well, I'm guessing we're out of here. Any big plans, Andy? You're back down south, I believe. Is that as of after this recording? Tomorrow morning, heading back down, working six shifts through up until um, next Saturday. And then I'll be back here next Sunday to record the next show. Uh, so it's a busy week ahead of me. Not sure where I'm going to slot in watching Thor Love and Thunder, but I will find space it's to watch it. It's going to be really weird not there. watching a Marvel film sat next to you. Yep. I've got another another month and a half of this backwards and forth. And then middle of August, I'll be uh, back up to Sheffield permanently. The time will fly by. So we'll be back again next week. So, Andy, enjoy your trip down south. Remember, it started as rioting, but right from the beginning, we knew this was different. (laughs) 